Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Good Energy Group PLC pre-AGM investor presentation and Q&A. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged, can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just please simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard, and we will send you an email to notify you when they're ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll, and if you would give that your kind attention, we would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand over to Nigel Pocklington, CEO from Good Energy Group. Good afternoon to you, sir. Good afternoon. Just checking you can hear me and we're ready to go. You're all good, sir. Great. Thank you very much. If we get the slides, please. I will introduce myself and my colleagues. So I'm Nigel Pocklington. I'm the relatively new chief executive of Good Energy, and I'm joined today by Rupert Sanson, who is our chief financial officer. Uh, and just to remind us, the reason we're here at all, really, is that the company has its annual general meeting next week. Uh, normally, those are open affairs and it'll be an opportunity for us to update our shareholders and wider stakeholders as to how the company is performing. Under COVID regulations, they are actually fairly closed events, so there's no meeting and business is very short. So in place of that, we have chosen to do a short update to shareholders today. First part of that was a release to the Stock Exchange this morning, just covering some additional colour on how the company is performing. And the second is today's uh, short presentation and Q&A session. So if we go on to the next slide, uh, just to give you a sense for what to expect. So after this short introduction from me, uh, I'm going to hand over to Rupert, who will cover some of the colour from our trading update today. I'll then make some remarks about our strategy and we will go into Q&A. And the initial part of the Q&A will be led by two members of uh, the Good Future Board, which is an initiative I shall cover before we get started with that phase of the meeting. Um, but if we go to the next slide, um, thank you. So uh, it's been a busy half year is probably the best summary for this slide. And I want to start uh, by uh, the, with the picture at the top of the slide there, which is Juliet Davenport, my predecessor. Um, Juliet has been involved in good energy for 20 years. She's the company's founder and has really been the kind of driver of its growth as a considerable force, uh, as initially a generator and now a supplier uh, of renewable energy in the UK, as well as uh, a significant figure in the wider debate around climate change and uh, carbon reduction. Um, which is uh, an extraordinary track record, and I'm very grateful for the fact that she's handing over a business in very good shape. Um, we're not losing Juliet overall at all, uh, entirely, by the way. You can change your CEO, but you, you can't and shouldn't change your founder. So Juliet as a non-executive director, and uh, I'm looking forward to being able to continue to benefit from both her experience and insight into the renewable world. Um, what she has done is enable, I think, a very smooth handover to me. So I've been able to come in uh, and I've been impressed with what I've found. Uh, this is a well-run business with obviously a very deep footprint in terms of renewable generation uh, with uh, a lot of opportunities for future growth. So what else have we been up to? We can see some snapshots there. We have successfully and hopefully reasonably smoothly changed our CEO. Um, we have been pushing very hard on what we would call our greenwashing agenda. So trying to emphasize the fact that the way in which we generate and source power means that we are covering the usage of our customers with genuinely renewable uh, electricity, which is not always the case for many tariffs called green. And I think you see there um, with you switch calling out a very high level of sort of gold standard for us and our tariffs, that we're beginning to land some, some cut through in terms of the idea that not every green tariff is as green as it perhaps claims, and that agenda continues. Um, ZapMap have been busy. This is our investment in a platform for electronic vehicle drivers, and we'll have a bit more content on that later in this conversation. And even today, we have been uh, launching, uh, I think, a very interesting report around um, how the UK can get to a zero carbon position in its power generation, really emphasizing the fact that you know, you've done well at renewables 
have the power to get us there. So a busy half a year for the company. And if we go on to the next slide, I'm going to hand over to Rupert to talk about what that means from a trading perspective. Great. Thank you, Nigel. Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. Um, so, so I'll do this in uh, three fairly brief uh, sections. Um, and as Nigel said, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of summary uh, takeout of uh, the trading update we uh, published this morning. So, so just around the sort of overall performance for the organization, um, year to date, uh, in line with uh, the expectations of the executive management uh, team, um, and it's really been characterized uh, by a sort of more sustained recovery uh, from uh, COVID. The first half of um, 2020 uh, saw probably the greatest sort of shock. Charlie, um, uh, Rupert, could I just ask you, just from a connectivity point of view, could I just ask you to turn the camera off at the top of the uh, presentation platform? Just if I could just ask you to do that, just to conserve your bandwidth, you seem to be having a little drop at that's perfect. Um, thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, in thank you, Mark. Um, so uh, just uh, continuing that theme on the, cu the current performance, um, over the course of the last six months, we've finalized uh, and completed uh, in 2020, and that's now operating well and normally across the entire organization. We're about 90% of the way through our business system uh, migration. Um, and our smart rollout, we've probably nearly trebled uh, the number of uh, smart meters we have across our uh, domestic estate from where we were at the end of 2020. So that uh, continues to accelerate. Second section really around the sort of balance sheet and liquidity uh, side of the business. So the first of the 24 weeks uh, of the year, our cash collection uh, is in line with our sort of usual uh, seasonal trends. Um, we're now we're now into a period of managing a, a sort of expected uh, short term uh, transition following that sort of business system. Uh, the next uh, weeks, um, next next week we uh, we uh, we pay seventy percent of good energy bonds too. So this was the uh, instrument and uh, bondholders uh, that took out uh, supported the business through two thousand and seventeen. Uh, to 2021. Um, so uh, this is the majority of that bond re being repaid next week. Um, and overall, following some of the work we did on the refinancing uh, earlier in this year, we're now we're now continuing to balance the returns we get on the generation assets, uh, the returns we get from the other parts of the operating uh, companies, uh, and looking at how we continue to deploy that into future investment, future growth, uh, the operational requirements of the business. Uh, and um, and uh, the resumption of dividend payments, which we uh, confirmed uh, earlier this year. Um, and Nigel uh, specifically touched on uh, ZapMap, and, 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 and so I'll pull out a couple of uh, pieces here, which again have been uh, announced uh, relatively recently. So the ZapMap business has recently uh, announced its plus and premium subscription packages. Um, on top of the base free version for its uh, subscriber base. Um, those are already starting to gain traction and uh, take up within the, within the subscriber base. Um, the other side of the subscription side is making sure that the platform, the Zappay platform, uh, is uh, rolling out across the uh, EV network. Uh, and so that continues with, uh, with, uh, with a number of other um, partners signed in the period. Um, and I think sort of complementing for both ZapMap customers and uh, good energy customers, uh, we're starting to see, particularly on the back of the smart rollout, which is a uh, uh, significant enabler of being able to offer more flexible tariffs uh, in this uh, transport uh, space. We have uh, recently uh, launched a, a very innovative ZapFlash tariff that uh, a number of you may have seen, uh, and our Green Driver tariff, which is specifically geared towards our uh, EV uh, customers. So, so I think accelerating some of the work that we've done on product and proposition, uh, but linked to that smart rollout, which uh, which I talked about in terms of the sort of overall performance update. So with that, I'll hand back uh, to you, Nigel. Um, and if you could move on the slides, Mark. 
Thank you. Uh, so just a few uh, comments from me, just to <coughs> maybe recap the company's strategy and where we might go from here. So first off, just to remind us all, you know, how we see ourselves and the direction we are traveling in. Um, so we are a vertically integrated renewable energy play. So we do, do still uh, generate some of our own power, uh, although uh, by no means anywhere near enough to cover the usage of our customers. We supplement that by working with over 1,600 generators around the, the country, specializing them in offering them quite long-term agreements to buy their power, which offer, obviously offers stability for individuals, businesses, communities who want to invest behind generation as well. Uh, so that's an important part of what we do. We are a supply business to both business and businesses, which is an increasing part of what we do, and domestic customers. We have about 270,000 customers, as we say there. Uh, there's a particular facet of that business which I think is worth calling out. We are one of the major players in terms of helping homes uh, and, to some extent, small businesses uh, administer the, their feed-in tariffs, the occasions where people are generating uh, power and wish to put it back into the grid as well as take from it. Uh, so that's a key part of our business uh, and one we're developing. And we are increasingly focused on how we can take what we do and turn it into energy services, really, by which I mean just help homes and businesses get towards a zero carbon position. So we are looking particularly at mobility, obviously, in that area, but also looking at aspects of um, domestic heating, uh, EV charging and the like. And ZapMap is obviously a big part of that vision. And there'll be more of that uh, to come. That's who we are. If we go to the next slide. Um, that is, to some extent, meaningless if it's not built on a strong uh, set of foundations. And I think one of the things I would emphasize having come into the business is that, uh, especially given its scale, this is a well-run uh, utility company that we're trying to build up on the back of. So in recent um, years, for example, we've successfully implemented a customer billing and management platform, which is called Kraken. It's one of the industry, an industry leading and quite forward looking uh, management systems that is, is now up and running. Um, I've touched a bit on mobility as a service, so the fact we're kind of trying to offer a broader package of uh, solutions for EV drivers. Uh, smart meter rollout, which we referenced in, the, referenced in the announcement today, that is an important aspect of anything we do now because a lot of the newer propositions we're exploring, you know, charge your EV overnight, charge your EV when the renewable grid is in surplus, all rely on the kind of connectivity you get from smart meters. So it's good to see those numbers increasing again now that we're out of the peak of the pandemic period. Um, we will be carrying on in that route. So a lot more time of use and other tariffs really aimed at EV drivers, solar generators and the like, and in many ways, the early adopters of a zero carbon position. Uh, and I started this, these comments talking about the domestic side of the business. Yeah, the business side is equally important and we are most of the way through, as you heard in uh, Rupert's remarks and also in our RNS this morning, uh, the installation of a business management and billing system, which is called NSEC. So we have strong building blocks in place. And if we go to the next slide, questions we're trying to answer is where can we go with this? And I think that map is a very good early example of what we're doing in this area. So as just to remind us, we are the majority owners uh, of this business, which is an app used by a you know, considerable majority, actually, of the UK's electronic vehicle owners. Um, and uh, the last few weeks have seen it um, really try and innovate around its, its kind of business model and propositions. So we are, we've, they for the first time have launched um, a paid for set of services, which offer sort of greater levels of value for people who are paying monthly or annual subscriptions. They continue to do deals with quite a, a large proportion of the UK's charging infrastructure so that rather than have customers offering, you know, holding up to 10 payment cards, for example, to, to pay for their uh, charging while on the road, you can pay for it just through the Zap Pay product. And they're exploring uh, a partnership with Fleetcore uh, to help, uh, you know, power um, what is an increasingly increasing segment of the UK's EV market, which is uh, small vans of commercial vehicles as well. So I think ZapMap are making considerable progress. Uh, if you go to the next slide. 
And that's a good way of really kind of thinking about our overall story. So, you know, the narrative we're building here is that we have a core of a renewable energy business with the platforms and expertise to manage that. But the direction we're traveling in is to really kind of build out platforms and services that help homes and businesses get to zero carbon. Uh, it's a very exciting journey to be on, and I'm looking forward to updating more and more of you uh, as we head along that journey. And certainly uh, my plan in terms of, you know, starting out on the job and getting in and getting into the CEO role here is that by the time we present our results to our half year results in September, we'll be able to put a bit more color around some of these aspects. But that's the journey we're on. Uh, and I think in many ways it is only just starting. So next slide. So I'm going to introduce um, couple of participants in a minute. So if you go on to actually the next slide again, then we can uh, talk about the future, Good Future Board. So this is a relatively new, new initiative, which is to really call out the fact that, you know, traditional company boards, where they have important jobs to fulfill, aren't necessarily a, a great source of diverse opinion. And that's certainly true in terms of representing the generation who are likely to be particularly affected by climate change and the way in which companies, businesses, society deal with it. So we have been working with the Good Future Board for a, a few months now uh, to sort of hear their perspectives and two members of the group, so Jack and Catherine, uh, are going to kick off the Q&A sections with some questions for me. So over to you, Mark. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, Catherine, if we could just ask you to bring on your camera, that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, guys, the floor is yours to, uh, to quiz management. So I just put on mute. Feel free to go ahead. Um, Jack, do you want to go first? No. Catherine, I think, do you want to crack on first and then we'll yeah. come back to Jack? Okay, um, well, my first question is, um, how do Good Energy propose to encourage more green investments and broader divestment from fossil fuels? Thanks, I can start with that one. Um, so there's a, I two or three aspects to this, really. One is, you know, we need to, we're going to continue to tell what we do. So there's, there's green and green in the energy market, as you're increasing it. So I would have seen that from the company I've come from before, we the green market. We should let people compare all of the energy tariffs in, in the country. And the majority of those claim to be green, but most of those are actually, you know, backed by renewable certificates, but they're actually, you know, in many ways, Sourced from the traditional power mix, so that the sort of the agenda first is kind of can we push harder behind the greenwashing agenda and help consumers understand that there is, you know, genuinely green power you can source out there. And I think the second aspect is something I was just touching on during the, the remarks there, which is really um, we need to be clear on what, what sort of customers' problem we're trying to solve here. Which fundamentally, I suppose, is it, it, this is actually quite hard to do. We're asking people to change the way in which they drive. We're asking people to change, which, change eventually the way in which they heat their homes. Um, and we need to make that as easy as possible, which means leaning on the sort of services that we're trying to build out that, yes, are kind of if you like backed by genuinely renewable power. But the real thing is kind of make it easier to own and operate an EV or make it easier to um, you know source renewable power for your home. And that really is where we think we're going to, to, to win. Okay, um, and my second question is, uh, are investors considering green energy over fossil fuels because they see financial potential or because they want to help the planet? <laughs> Sorry, in front of all your investors. <laughs> uh, no, 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 I think that they, they would gladly welcome the challenge. To uh, and increasingly and happily, the answer is both. And okay. I don't mean that as a politician's answer. I mean, if you were to say to somebody, you know, if you're ignoring our green credentials for a moment, why should you invest in good energy? I think at its root, the answer is, you know, the way in which we generate and source power and the products we are developing to help you understand how you use that power should mean that we have a growing number of customers who stick with us longer than the average. And that is a good investment that will offer you a return combined yeah. with the fact that, um, you know, everybody can see that consumer interest in renewables and green energy and like is growing and therefore this is likely to be a growing market. So, you know, I'm more than happy to make the case to our investors that this is a good investment for those reasons. As it happens, happily, there is a huge increase in 
um, ethical investing, if you like, uh, in most fund managers and, and private investors as well. And they're very interested in the cre environmental credentials of the companies they're investing in. And, and naturally enough, investing in a company like us particularly suits that agenda. So it will bring things behind green power. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's no good answers. So, so Catherine, if, if that's if you're um, complete with questions, Jack, can you hear us? Okay, I know you're coming in on a on a mobile phone. I'm going to try and release your microphone now, just to make sure. But I think we're going to have there is a dial-in option, um, Jack, which may be better when you click on the link. Just to click on the dial-in option, and you can dial in. I think you are coming in on a on a mobile phone, which is um, going to cause slight complexities. But that's that's hope. Jack, can you hear us? Okay. Jack, can you hear us okay? Ah. Let's just give Jack a, a second longer, if I may. Catherine, do you have the, the questions that, that Jack was going to be posing? Just in yeah. the in the meantime, perhaps I could just ask uh, Jack one more time. If you can't hear us, Jack, we're going to move on to, to Catherine. I think Jack will hate me forever, but... Um, sorry. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. Catherine, if I could put, put, pose back to you, just to, to perhaps ask the questions on behalf of Jack, that would be great. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Um, okay, so uh, uh, this is a question for um, Nigel as the new CEO. Uh, do you have any specific goals or hopes for good energy? Um, I think it's usually wise if you're the new CEO to kind of keep your cards close to your chest a little bit on this for a while. But uh, my broad hope really is um, that we can help take something that everybody thinks of as a utility. We are, after all, a utility company, <laughs> by which I mean, you know, yes, vital, terribly important, <clears throat> but often perceived as being a bit dull and happens in the background. And, you know, obviously, you, you sell it, usually domestic consumers set up direct debits to pay their bills, and maybe they don't think about it until a bit higher than it was, and then they think about it quite a lot. But, it, it, you know, it's not a product that people engage in. And I think success here for the next few years really is taking a company that's got amazing roots in terms of renewable energy and turning it into much more of a product in the way that the, the digital world will think about a product, i.e. something that people find engaging to think about and interact with more often. And so, you know, anything we, we're doing to help you understand how to use your EV more effectively or what your domestic consumption looks like and, and how you might change it to make it more efficient and that sort of thing. Those, I think, if, if there's a vision we want to try and achieve, it's to sort of be more of a product and services company and less of a utility by the end of three years. So that's really the sort of the, the idea that excites me. Okay. Um, uh, how is Good Energy's greenwashing campaign doing? Uh, well, I think the greenwashing campaign, just to recap, that really is where we are trying to point to the inconsistencies in the way um, uh, companies can describe their tariffs as green, even if really all they're doing is buying what are called renewable certificates from a market for certificates. They're not particularly uh, able to say that the power that the, their customers use is genuinely sourced by renewables. Uh, and actually, that is becoming a very successful consumer campaign in two or three areas. So I would point to the fact that you switch, who are the biggest sort of um, comparison engine in uh, domestic energy, have very recently um, launched a, a sort of gold, silver, bronze award scheme about how green is your tariff. And really, you know, we absolutely dominate the gold category. I think there are roughly speaking 10 or so tariffs in, of which we are seven. Uh, and so, you know, that is absolutely the sort of stamp of approval we want for our anti-greenwashing campaign. It's beginning to ruffle feathers, certainly amongst some of our competitors, which I'm absolutely fine with because I think we should be pointing fingers. Uh, the more interesting side of it will be whether we can begin to uh, affect some sort of legislative or other consumer protection change and, and it's a consultation phase with the various relevant bodies so it, it's certainly not done yet and i'm hoping that what is in my mind something of a consumer perfection protection rather gap at the moment uh, is gets closed in the of course the next year or so okay and um can you explain what you mean by energy as a service and mobility as a service and how you plan to sell these things to average customers? 
yeah, I mean, that's the, the sort of the key question, really. So I think it is the more we can basically make it easier for you to adopt green energy, uh, the better. So if it's if it's a car, then let, let, you know we'll help you kind of plan your routes, understand where you know where you can charge, pay for your charging, potentially get a charge point, or at least work with somebody who will supply you know, and then supply you with renewable energy. Uh, and the same would apply to sort of home generating. If you've got a solar panel or something. Let's make it easy for you to understand what you're generating. What is so the whole idea is basically, you know, the consumer knows where they want to get to. I want to live a life you know nearer to zero carbon we're going to make it easier to do that and we need to do more than just supply your power in order to do that's great catherine is there uh, do you have any further questions uh, for the team or are you um Oh, no, I think that was everything. Perfect. Catherine, well, listen, thank you very much indeed for uh, for, for stepping in. And apologies to Jack in uh, in Devon, who was uh, coming in on his mobile, but you've done a ter terrific job, uh, Catherine. Mm -hmm. So thanks once again. If I could just ask you just to turn off, uh, off your camera, that'd be absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much indeed. Um, um, Nigel, um, obviously we're going to, I guess, move on to um, shareholder Q&A, if, uh, if that timing is right. Uh, yes, if you want to go to the next Perfect. slide. Well, thank, thank you very, very much indeed, um, Nigel. Um, obviously, investors had the ability to pre-submit questions, and of course, they've also submitted a number of questions during um, today's event. Um, perhaps I could start the Q&A off uh, with a number of questions that fall into, I guess, some distinct categories, the first one being strategic. It reads as follows. You are now reducing debt by paying back a significant proportion of the bond. What do you intend to do? Make more investments? And if so, in what? Um, yes, actually, I might bring Rupert in just to start with a sort of summary of why we paid back the bond, because yeah. I can then also work what we might do from here. So why pay it down? So I think that the bond, uh, the bond was launched in uh, the middle of 2017. And uh, like the first bond, um, we achieved a number of uh, investments and uh, developments uh, with that. The first bond was very much focused on renewable generation. Um, the second bond was focused more around uh, starting the uh, systems transformations, the early days of uh, SMART, uh, as well as starting to move into, uh, at that point in time, sort of more nascent areas of uh, energy services. Um, it is a... Uh, it is a um, it was an interest, an instrument that uh, that that had a certain uh, lifespan. So it ran until uh, the initial redemption of um, June twenty twenty one. So it wasn't necessarily um, a a good route of long term financing after that uh, first four year period. Um, so it was in our plans to uh, to look to redeem. Uh, that uh, as and when we were as and when we were able uh, and obviously the refinancing of the generation assets uh, this year provided uh, an additional uh, capacity to make uh, major inroads into that um, into that redemption um i mean i'll i mean i'll sort of just gently move into some yeah. of the areas of future investment um i mean i think that uh, the areas of um, uh, mobility as a service and energy as a service are going to uh, require investment, uh, whether that is investment is in uh, partnerships or capability or resources, systems, companies. I think at the moment we do not know uh, exactly what uh, route that will take, uh, but I think that over the course of the next couple of years, it's going to be into those areas that we are going to be deploying some capital um, uh, in order to uh, grow our offerings in that space. Yes, I think, so, I, mean, I think pretty early in my tenure as CEO, so I'm obviously not going to sort of um, go right into everything we might invest in. I think that's something we can begin to cover in September. So I suspect it's going to be uh, the areas we'll be investing in will be some combination, as we've heard, of the energy as a service platforms. We'll see how that map goes through the summer in terms of some very interesting launches they're working on. Um, we have just kicked off and mentioned it in actually in our communication with the bondholders. Uh, a new management system for our feed-in tariff portfolio, which uh, I think is an important part of the business. There's another good example of areas we're investing behind. Uh, we will then sort of figure out quite what level of investment is needed. 
and what the best way of financing that is going from there. But there are plenty, there's no shortage of ideas, as you might expect, given our positioning within the renewable market and our desire to sort of push on from just being a utility. Thank you very much indeed. I know you did mention within the presentation around uh, your investment in, in uh, ZapMap, but the question that we have now reads as follows. What is the long-term ambition for your investment in ZapMap? Is investing in an EV startup a good use of shareholder funds? Sure. Um, before we get on to ask it, is it worth us trying to put the camera on again? just to see? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And um, we had a, a question from Peter H. Um, um, I think your bandwidth, as we're uh, unfortunately diagnosing it, is, is coming out at less than 10, which is going to cause that intermittence. But let's feel free. Let's do put on the camera. Let's make it a bigger uh, image and let's go for it. And apologies to the uh, intermittency. If we do lose you, I will jump back in because I think your quality of audio is more important. But um, let's go for it. You know, why invest in ZapMap, which you know is to some extent quite an early stage venture, it might be the most natural thing for a public company like us to do. I think uh, two or three thoughts there. One, it is early stage, but it's market position in terms of you know proportion of EV drivers that it already reaches is actually very significant, and so it feels that that in itself is enough of a foothold for us to a position rather for us to want to try and invest behind especially when a good is by and large a business that really appeals to or a brand that appeals to early adopters in a lot of areas and EV drivers will naturally uh, fall into that category. And I think the second thing I'd say is, you know, in the overall scheme of things, our investments so far are relative. So um, I, we feel pretty positive our investment is that what we're beginning to learn and see in terms of other ways of Nigel, I am going to just bring back up the slides and just to ask you to turn off the camera. It's, uh, apologies, but it's the uh, the broadband will consume more through the camera than it does the audio, and I think your audio uh, will be impacted. And I'd rather have building better quality audio. That's great. If we just let that settle down for two seconds. So, Nigel, can you hear me? Okay. Apologies, ladies and gentlemen, just wait uh, one moment just while we bring um, Nigel and the uh, team back into the room. That'd be great. Nigel, can you hear me okay? I can see your microphone's now back on. I'm hoping that you can hear me okay. We can now, yes. That's perfect. I, I do apologize, but it's the unfortunately the video feed will be consuming most of your speed. So if we can keep it to, to this and apologies to uh, to the intermittency of the uh, of the audio just then. Um, Nigel, the next question uh, around strategy is, you know, what are your plans for the strategic direction of the business as we move forward? Um well, I think we've, we've sort of touched on some themes through this presentation, probably deliberately at quite a high level. Don't forget, I've been in role less than two months. Uh, so I, the plan is that we will put more, much more sort of colour behind this uh, to our investors at the half year results presentation in September. But the overall direction, I'm, you touched on with uh, questions from the youth board earlier, is to, uh, you know, having got this foothold in terms of deep green generation and supply, explore how we can build out services, particularly focused on you know, the decentralized energy grid, people want to generate their own power, EV drivers initially, um, to help them uh, you know, to be more, more like sort of services that help you adopt fuel and less like just the supply of, uh, supply of power. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Just moving on, I guess, into the more financial uh, questions uh, that we received. What has been the impact of COVID on the company's finances, profitability and outlook? So I'm going to bring Rupert back in on the impact of COVID, which actually the companies, I think, from my point of view, having come in at the tail end of this, done a very good job of managing its way through and surviving. Yeah, no, I think that's a, I think that's a good, I think that's a good summary. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's been a, it's been a, uh, relatively sort of tough operationally in the uh, in the early instances of um, COVID, but I'd say through uh, really from sort of mid-April uh, onwards, we've operated um, as we talked last year 
uh, relatively uh, relatively normally, despite not being able to uh, sort of undertake some of our uh, services as we normally would. Um, I think the I think the sort of impacts from a sort of profitability perspective were uh, most significantly seen in the first half of last year. Um, it was that first lockdown where the sort of most significant shocks to the energy system at large uh, were seen. Um, through the rest of 2020, um, in terms of impact on finances, we retained some additional uh, debt provisioning, um, more really looking at the overall impact of uh, COVID on the sort of wider economy, um, rather than the uh, underlying behavior of uh, our customers. Um, we've, seen, we've seen continued uh, reduction in some of the sort of business segments. And I would say in terms of outlook, uh, it's made us more cautious in terms of some of the business customers uh, that we've been taking on. So I think the, the level of growth we'd seen over the course of the years before um, hasn't been repeated uh, during the course of the last um, 12 to 15 months uh, as we look at the sectors which we feel uh, are going to remain resilient to uh, the recovery. Um, I mean, in terms of sort of overall uh, overall impact on finances, we haven't seen uh, a, a particularly significant impact on our domestic uh, customer payment um, pattern. Um, and we hope that that will continue as uh, a number of sort of government schemes start to unwind um, later this year. But I would say that we've remained pretty resilient uh, through the entire uh, period. And whilst we have um, uh, taken some financial impact associated with those uh, lockdown uh, first first lockdown shock um, and some of the reduced demand through the, the following uh, nine month period. Uh, the impact to date has been certainly at the lower end of our expectations in terms of uh, what it could have been. Thank you. Um, sorry, Nigel, did you want to add anything or shall I just move well, on to that? That summarizes it very well. I think you know, we were viewing this from, I was in a different part of the market when COVID struck on the price comparison side, we had a significant concern that consumer levels of consumer indebtedness would really impact the energy supply business. And certainly uh, the, it would appear to be the case that, um, good energy's, uh, position is pretty sound. Thank you very much indeed. Um, next question relating to the dividends. Do you plan to restart the dividend? Uh, Rupert, again, because we, we have, yeah, we have yes. given some comments about this. Yeah, we have. So, uh, so, so simply, uh, yes. Um, uh, as we touched upon in the uh, trading update and in, uh, and in the uh, results at the end of the year, we will always look at the uh, competing demands of our cash in terms of investment growth. Uh, returns to shareholders, but yes, we have uh, we have um, committed to the restart of that dividend program within FY21. Great, thank you. Um, the next question reads as follows: Why did you refinance the generation assets, and who are Gravis? Well, you were very close to that. Uh, so, so I get there's a financial question. Yeah, to see it, yeah. So, go on. Yeah, so uh, this was a, this was quite a substantial exercise we undertook in uh, Q1 of this year. Um, and it followed on the work that we did in the second half of 2020 around the uh, revaluation of those uh, generation assets. Um, I think it's really three reasons why we uh, undertook the, um, the refinancing. The first was one of simplification. Uh, so this puts the uh, assets into uh, one loan group uh, as opposed to the two that um, existed before. Um, the second, the second was around an ability to reset the covenants on those loans, uh, both by putting all the assets into one group, um, but they also have five years of generation history. Um, and so by resetting those covenants based on the um, uh, operating performance that they have demonstrated, uh, it's enabled us to get a much clearer long-term outlook on the cash generation from those assets based on the resetting of those covenants. Um, and the third, um, and it links a little bit to that to that second point, uh, is again having operated uh, those uh, assets within the financing group for the last five years, we were able to take some of the money that was restricted within that asset group, uh, a little over four million pounds, and put it back into the 
uh, business, and that is some of the money that we are using to to repay uh, the bond. Um, Gravis, so it's Gravis Capital Partners. They are a um, infrastructure investor uh, providing um, debt finance predominantly to both social and uh, green uh, infrastructure uh, in the UK. Um, their funds, a number of their funds are listed on the uh, London Stock Exchange, which is where one, which is where our assets are held in one of their um, green infrastructure funds. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Rupert. There is one more financial question, I guess, and then it's it's back uh, back over to to you, Nigel. But it just asks, why are you changing auditors? It's a good question, and I think one that I might have answered in two thousand and eighteen when we uh, or two thousand and seventeen when we changed our auditor to EY. So back in two thousand and seventeen, we appointed EY. We felt that Big Four. Um, was the most appropriate um, auditor for uh, a listed uh, AIM business. I think over the course of the last four years, we've seen the second tier of auditors move much closer uh, to that, uh, to the big four. And we've seen the big four more concentrated in the space of the larger international main list listed groups. And Good Energy doesn't fall into any of those uh, three uh, categories. Um, so I think that we consider the change now uh, is is appropriate. We think it's a good cost effective um, uh, change, and we're looking forward to the new perspective and the new challenge that uh, that uh, Mazars bring to us. Thank you very much indeed. Well, moving away from financials and, and I guess on to performance, the, the next question reads as follows. How is the domestic customer base faring in the current environment? Given the price cap, COVID impact on personal finances and greenwashing debate, how do you view this uh, in the future? I take that. I and mean, obviously, I should be careful just to sort of limit myself to the financial information that we've already published, if you like. Um, as, as we said in our trading statement this morning, it's sort of faring for, you know, in, in line with our expectations, really, which is to say, as Rupert mentioned in, in COVID, whilst there is a concern, I think, generally around consumer indebtedness and the withdrawal of government schemes, and like, there's no evidence so far of that having any impact on, uh, you know, bad debt levels with our customer portfolio and the like. And uh, you know, the domestic energy market is in quite an interesting place at the moment because You've had, you know, last year with a lot of wholesale energy prices falling initially and, and quite a very, a very price competitive marketplace in reaction to that. As prices are rising, actually, a lot of providers have bunched up in the uh, similar sort of range, which is an interesting moment for us because whilst we're, we are very confident in our pricing stance, which is that we're not going to lose money on any of the domestic tariffs we sell and that we, you know, are going to explain to consumers that, committing to 100% renewable power means that generally prices will be that bit higher. At the moment, we're not that out of line with the market, certainly on some of our fixed tariffs, which is making us a bit more competitive. It's an interesting uh, development to watch. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the final two uh, pre-submitted kind of questions relate to more operational. And the first one reads, how do you ensure that there won't be issues for customers resulting in poor service from new billing systems that have been implemented Previous billing system integrations have led to issues for many customers. Uh, it's a very good question. Thank you for raising it. I mean, you're right. Uh, billing system in, uh, changes, I think, are the stuff of nightmares for utility company CEOs. And, and you know, why is that? Well, um, because so much hangs off the back of them. And, and if things go wrong, then quite quickly you can find yourself having missed one, two months of billing and the cash flow implications of that. Are considerable and the amount of cleanup you need to do if it goes awry is considerable so um they're projects that you embark on with a considerable degree of focus on risk management and backup and i think where we are at the moment is that we've got kraken on the domestic side which is now up and running and we're comfortable with its performance from a domestic point of view so we know we can see if you like that we are managing and billing our domestic customers and that's going well on the business side with NSEC, we're in the middle of a project there, and we've made quite a lot of efforts to make sure that the sort of risk management side of that project is well developed. So we're running systems in backup, for example, the, the legacy system still, which means that we can bill 
large amounts of our business portfolio if we need to from the old system until we're happy that the new is running. Uh, and we have quite a lot of focus on uh, checks within that world to make sure that as that system is rolled out, uh, we are not going to cause too much of an impact with it. So yes, it's a significant risk, but it's being managed as a significant risk. And uh, we would hope by the time we're through the summer that in both our domestic and business portfolios, we are through that uh, process. Thank you very much, Nigel. And the final question uh, relating to operational matters, how is the delayed smart meter rollout progressing now that restrictions have eased? How many customers have, ha have smart meters and what are the benefits? Sure. So we've got some numbers out actually in our release this morning, which I think was to say that we've added was about 8,000, um, 9,000 smart meters uh, this year. So you can get a sense there that as um, people are either initially just got a bit more comfortable with uh, you know, workers coming to their house, but more as the restrictions ease, the pickup rate is beginning to, to build there. Uh, and we'll carry on uh, doing that. We've got a, quite a focus on smart rollout in our operational team. The benefits, I think, are twofold. One is just in terms of the basic customer experience of being a utility customer. It makes it much smoother because obviously you're getting real-time updates uh, as to usage, which means the risk of a bill shock, if you like, um, uh, is much reduced. The second is that it is the information that then powers the kind of platforms and tools we're developing to help people either understand their consumption patterns better or even you know, shift their consumption and pay differently and, and get a better deal because of it. So things like the time of use tariffs we're doing for EV drivers now, which are basically you know, charge, set your car to charge overnight are enabled by smart meters. So there's a real reason for people who maybe have been a bit reluctant to do it in the past to do so now. And I think also as frankly, as, as pieces of consumer hardware they're in a much better place now. The SMETS 2, the sort of more advanced uh, meter, has dealt with quite a lot of the initial problems that smart meters had, uh, and we're pretty confident recommending them to our customers. Nigel, that's absolutely brilliant. And thank you to both uh, to yourself and Rupert for taking all those pre-submitted questions. Um, I guess we've got a little bit of time re remaining. I don't know whether you want to open up the Q&A tab that's on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, thank you to all those questions that have uh, come in from investors, and thank you to those investors for taking the time to do so. Perhaps I could ask you maybe to read out the question, who it's from, and give a response where it's appropriate to do so. And of course, any questions you don't get through, we will make them available to you post this meeting, uh, and we can publish responses to investors as well. So if I hand back to you, perhaps, and then I'll pick up from you uh, nearer the close. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, and I think what we'll do is where we've got questions which are around sort of strategy or business um, performance, Mike, we'll, we'll try and pick them up if they add to the Q&A we've already done. Obviously, uh, there are some uh, investor customers on the Q&A. It's very good to hear from you. Uh, and we're very you know, happy to deal with your individual question, but we'll probably do that offline just to try and help um, uh, you know, deal with the more personal um, information that's being submitted there. But there's a good one, for example, here from David L. When will Good Energy be rolling out their own electric vehicle charge points as the Ecotricity have done? If not, why not? Um, and that's from David Luckhurst. Um, so a couple of answers to this one. One is a sort of new CEO answer. So I'm just about to sort of uh, you know, review various parts of the business. So I haven't had really a chance to sort of get into this in detail. We do have a charge point um, pr product we're trying, we're trying called One Point, which is I think more aimed at sort of businesses than consumers at the moment. I would be wary of really going into the sort of branded charge point world for a couple of reasons. One it is quite significant sort of investment in physical assets so the capital requirements of it are likely to be quite heavy and secondly it is a reasonably well served uh, market already with people who are actually infrastructure investors and i think i'm more interested in you know, providing the the power and the sort of services to sort of understand how that power can be used and lead the infrastructure investment to other people and i think Ecotricity is a good example of this. Uh, you know, in the last couple of weeks, they've announced uh, actually that they've sold some part of their um, EV charging uh, investment to, again, an infrastructure investor. Uh, we have a second one here from um, Peter F. Are you planning to introduce householder energy services advice for things such as EV charging points at heat pumps? I think many households would welcome advice to help them navigate the path to low carbon lifestyle. So I think in 
the spirit of that question is very interesting because I think that, you know, if we're trying to aim the business at solving a particular customer problem, it's that, look, I'd like to be zero carbon, but help me get there. And I think, you know, some of the initial things we've done on EVs are beginning to help that, but there's more we can do. Um, heat pumps are in some ways a technology that's further down the line. We've begun with a specialist heat pump tariff and a, and a sort of a, a servicing um, contract, and we'll look, take a look at how that works. That's likely to be a kind of phase two type move. But the underlying spirit of that question, I think, yes, that's where I'd see the company going. Next question. Should we take that one? So from Felicity, I can't have a smart meter on my property because the gas meter is at one side and the electricity meter is at the other. But I've been an investor for many years, thank you, and an EV driver and a fit supplier. How is the lack of a smart meter likely to disadvantage me? Um, well, it, I think it is a fact is, uh, that you know smart meters are becoming increasingly important in terms of helping households um, engage with some of these technologies. So we may need to take, take you offline as an individual and see if there's anything we can do to help. I think the problem will be uh, technologies that rely on kind of real time information about uh, you know what are you using, you know helping you engage with say a time of use tariff for an EV if we haven't got the smart meter link. That's where it will get harder. Uh, and, you know, we'll probably need to think about uh, the, the, and then we get a number of examples most weeks of people for whom smart meter installation is a challenge. There's still a big problem with their connectivity in some parts of the country as well as to what we can offer without the smart meter link. Kit, as an ex-high school teacher who values student leadership, I'm exceptionally pleased and impressed with the Good Futures Board initiative. What assurances can you give me as a shareholder that the board will be more than tokenistic? Um, well, I think uh, that's a very good uh, caution. So I was also very interested in the initiative as I came in because I think it is rooted in a very good um, uh, underlying thought, really, which is around the generation affected by this are not the generation sitting on company boards. Um, so having launched the initiative, I think it is one we're you know, happy to go on record as saying we're going to pursue uh, the Good Energy Board are kind of re regularly engaged with the company and management team. They'll be engaging with me pretty regularly as well. So we do see this as an important sort of outreach exercise for us, uh, an important sort of different voice in the room. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can have our sort of assurances and public record here that it is a lot more than a tokenistic exercise. Uh, Alex, why have you chosen now to launch a subscription service in Zap, that map? Surely now is still about the land grab as EV ownership and use ramps up and then add the cost down the line. Does this increase the risk of being the owner? So I can understand the point there, Alex. Thank you. It's, it's, it is a good question. Um, I think, you know, why go now? Two or three points. Unusually, Zap map has a very strong position amongst EV drivers already. So if there's a land, land grab going on, uh, it's done pretty well in it. I suppose second point, it, already, it still has a free solution to it, so which is all around the sort of mapping side of things. So in terms of a tool that, uh, you know, we want to encourage new EV owners to use, then there's a non-paying way of doing that still. I think what we do think the time is right, though, to do is to, to begin to understand how we can build that map into a business with recurring revenue streams, hence the, the launch of uh, the subscription products. That gives us a couple of things to look at. One is kind of the opportunities for partnering more fully with good energy and whether there is a sort of bundling with relevant tariffs that we can do. And I think secondly, I would point out, I suppose that whilst charging for something is always a bit of a barrier, uh, the price points are pretty low. Um, and uh, I think on balance, it is worth going for it now. I would draw a bit of a parallel with something I did much earlier in my digital career, which was when I was working at the Financial Times and FT.com uh, went for a subscription uh, based model at a time in which the perceived wisdom was keep everything free and grow as, as much as you can. I think subsequently, because the FT had a sufficient differentiated product, and I think for, my, for a moment that ZapMap has this as well, that it proved to be a wise move to go early and just begin to get the idea that it was a value to pay for. So. Um, early days, but I'm very happy that ZapMap have gone for this. And I don't think we're necessarily risking the overall position, even though you're correct to say that the EV market's pretty nascent. Uh, next um, questions. 
And some of these I don't know the answer to, but I'm going to look to um, uh, any of my other colleagues. So if we keep scrolling down, uh, I think there's a good one from Andy M there, which is as the UK grid decarbonizes towards 2050, how does good energy remain differentiated and relevant to consumers? And I think the answer to that is that the nub of the, the sort of strategic themes we've begun to talk about and will continue to develop, which is there's probably still a window for the next few years for us to make some inroads, helping consumers understand that there is green energy and green energy, and that our particular approach to generation and supply uh, is genuinely 100% renewable. But if the grid gets to anywhere near that point, which it will, then you're right, that's not going to be a differentiated product any further, and which is where the energy services agenda comes in, because by that point, you would hope to have a majority of your customers, be they business or domestic, um, engaging in some sort of product or service from us that helps them understand their usage, helps them time their usage, helps them sort of sell power back into the grid and the like, because uh, you know I think nobody here would suggest that just resting on our laurels as a deep green generator and supplier is the future of the company. You scroll down. Obviously, Nigel, there are obviously for every question you seem to answer, there's another one that uh, that's fired at you. So I'm just mindful of time as well. And I know uh, feedback from investors is important, but uh, feel free just to run through as many of these questions as you feel uh, you can. Otherwise, we'll present them back to you after the events finish for you to review. Thank you very much, Mike. It's a good reminder, actually. Um, I think we're probably running out of time at this point. So we'll take the remaining questions that have been asked. Uh, and make sure that we kind of publish some answers either if they're from individuals then we'll, we'll come back to you through i think the customer service route if you like and try and help with your individual question the more strategy and policy based ones will, will sort of take as a broader set of q a but i think all that remains me for me to do is to uh thank um the two members of the good energy uh, youth board it's kathleen and jack for joining us rupert for his remarks as well and all of you for your interest in the company uh, and for participating in the meeting today. Um, I think AGM votes actually are closed now, aren't they? So we've next week. next week, okay. So the AGM vote closes next week. So if you're a shareholder and have yet to vote, can I just take the opportunity once again to um, plug the importance of your participation in this particular part of the company's calendar. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much. Uh, and I look forward to meeting you hopefully face to face before long. Nigel, Rupert, thank you very much indeed for updating investors today. And also thank you to both to Jack and uh, Catherine also for their participation. Uh, could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few minutes to complete and I'm sure will be greatly valued by Rupert and Nigel. Um, on behalf of the management team of Good Energy Group PLC, we'd like to thank you very much for attending this afternoon's presentation. That now concludes today's session. Good afternoon to you all.